I cut my own salary by 50%. Agonizing and debating over every individual, we laid off 40% of our workforce, 40% of the company I'd spent the last three years of my life building. When I assembled our remaining employees to explain to them that this was the only way we could stay afloat and stay together, I felt my composure collapsing and I broke down sobbing in front of our employees. Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. For this episode of Acton Line, we're bringing you a panel discussion from the Grand Rapids edition of the Free Market Roadshow, an event the Acton Institute recently co-hosted along with the Austrian Economic Center. In this conversation, entitled Unleashing the Entrepreneur, the panelists explore the theme of entrepreneurship and how it can be a key driver of economic growth and prosperity, as well as examine the challenges that entrepreneurs face, such as regulatory barriers and access to capital, and how these challenges can be overcome to unleash the full potential of a market economy. Our panelists discuss how entrepreneurs can play a crucial role in addressing societal issues and creating positive change through innovation and entrepreneurship, and on the importance of empowering individuals to take control of their own economic destinies and how this can lead to greater prosperity for all. This panel features John Chisholm, who has three decades of experience as an entrepreneur, CEO, and investor. A pioneer in online marketing research, he founded and served as CEO and chairman of Decisive Technology, now a part of Google, publisher of the first desktop and client server software for online surveys. And Dylan Palman, a research fellow here at Acton, where he also serves as executive editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. I want to welcome everybody back to the uh, Free Market Road Show here in Grand Rapids. Uh, my name is Eric Cohn. I am the Director of Marketing and Communications here at the Acton Institute, who's uh, really thrilled to be hosting this event today. Uh, I want to welcome my panelists for the session where we are going to be discussing Unleashing the Entrepreneur. Uh, I want to remind people that we are taking questions for this over Slido. So if you go to slido.com and you enter uh, uh, FRMS, that'll get you into the queue. Enter your questions there and I'll be uh, reading through those as we go through the uh, discussion today. Uh, I want to thank both of our panelists as they join us. John Chisholm, uh, who's right here to my right, uh, has three decades of experience as an entrepreneur, CEO, and investor, a pioneer in online marketing research. He founded and served as CEO and chairman of Decisive Technology, now a part of Google, a publisher of the first desktop and client server software for online surveys. Uh, later, he founded and served as CEO chairman of uh, Customer, Customer Stat, now part of Confirmit a leading provider in enterprise feedback management. Today, he is CEO of John Chisholm Ventures. How'd you come up with that name? Uh, a startup advisory and angel investing group. Uh, he is past president and chair of the Worldwide MIT Alumni Association, a member of the MIT Corporation Board of Trustees, and a trustee of the Santa Fe Institute. He is the author of Unleash Your Inner Company, Use Passion and Perseverance to Build Your Ideal Business, we're also going to uh, give away a free copy of that book, and uh, John will choose one lucky person uh, after the event who will, we already see one enthusiastic hand up. I, Kurt being enthusiastic, that's entirely new to me. Um, he also holds a BS and MS degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School. To his right is my Acton colleague, Dylan Palman, who is the executive editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality and a research fellow here at the Acton Institute. He's the author of the book Foundations of a Free and Virtuous Society, published here by Acton in 2017. And he is a PhD candidate in the Institute for Theology and Liberal Arts at St. Mary's University, Twickenham, London. So welcome to both of them. 
John, I want to start with you. Uh, so our subject is unleashing the entrepreneur. And, you know, I've read through your bio here. You sound like an entrepreneur who has been unleashed. Uh, walk us through your personal experience, um, your ed- entrepreneurial endeavors, and the characteristics kind of both that are innate and that you develop over time to really engage in, in entrepreneurship. Well, uh, first of all, Eric, thanks so much for having me. It's a thrill to be here at Acton. Um, I'd like to start by taking you back to the single year of my life where I learned the most about entrepreneurship, business, and life. And that year was 2000 and 2001, the dot-com bust. Now, just to refresh your memory, the internet first became commercially available and productized in the 1990s. Billions of dollars were invested and over-invested Uh, commercializing the internet. Companies like Amazon, eBay, Google, all all were uh, started during that time. And that huge overinvestment peaked in 1999 and collapsed in 2000 and 2001, the dot-com bust, when tens of thousands of uh, internet companies started going out of business. At that time, I was running my second company, Customer Set, We did online customer satisfaction measurement. Started the company in 97. We grew rapidly and had healthy growth for the first three years. But in the first quarter of 2001, I would often wake up in sweat-soaked sheets sticking to my skin at 2 in the morning. Our second round of financing, our Series B round, refused to close despite a flurry of meetings with investors as we ran out of cash. Those nights I would get up, shower off the sweat, and try to get back to sleep. When my management team and I finally realized that our Series B round was not going to close, we huddled to figure out what to do. First, we cut our own salaries and those a few weeks later of all of our employees by 10%. I cut my own salary by 50%. Agonizing and debating over every individual we laid off 40% of our workforce, 40% of the company I'd spent the last three years of my life building. When I assembled our remaining employees to explain to them that this was the only way we could stay afloat and stay together, I felt my composure collapsing, and I broke down, sobbing, in front of our employees. They stood there stunned, sympathetic, and embarrassed that their CEO was crying in front of them. That First quarter of 2001, our revenues fell by 20%, a lot for a recurring revenue software as a service business. To help us get through, one of our investors lent me $300,000 for the company, but not to the company, but for me to pass through to the company, meaning that I would be personally liable for repaying that loan. Later, I would repay that investor, to whom, despite the arrangement, I was deeply grateful by mortgaging the townhouse that I lived in in Menlo Park, California. Uh, To save on rent, we consolidated in the less attractive second floor of our building to, and rented out the first floor to another company. That company, another startup, came in, uh, quit paying us rent after about 60 days, came in late one weekend night, cleared out all their belongings, and disappeared without a trace. To help make payroll, we factored receivables. That is, we sold our future receivables for a 20% discount for cash today, an expensive maneuver you don't want to do routinely. I I dropped my salary to minimum wage, the legal limit. Finally, we could see profitability ahead in the third quarter of 2001. And then, as you know, on September 11th, terrorists attacked the World Trade Center. The entire Northeast communications grid was down. It took an entire day just to confirm that all of our employees were still alive. Even though we were 3,000 miles away on the, in Silicon Valley, on the west coast of the United States, even there, every company I know of had customers or clients who lost employees or family members in the terrorist attacks. If the dot-com bust of 2000 and 2001 did not kill a startup, almost certainly the terrorist attacks of September 11th did. Well, we did not make a profit in that first quarter of 2000 in that third quarter of 2001. We did break even in the fourth quarter. 
Uh, the going kept tough for the next 18 months. Uh, we didn't hire a single new employee for 18 months, but we made it through, and the company was acquired in the first quarter of 2008. Often I've wondered why did customer sat survive when so many other companies, most other companies of our size and cohort, failed. I absolutely don't think we were smarter than other management teams. We absolutely did not have more in the way of resources than other management teams did. Customer Sat only raised $2.94 million in its entire life. One of our clients was Webvan, which raised $75 million before its IPO, and then famously $300 million in its IPO, and then declared bankruptcy 14 months after its IPO. So we didn't have more in the way of resources. If I had to attribute it to just two factors, I would say it was these. Number one, we cared more deeply about our t company than other management teams did, about all aspects of it, about the coolness of our products, our relationships with our customers, and about each other more than other management teams did. And two, we stuck with it longer. As I mentioned, it was another seven years before the company was acquired. Many other companies just gave up and threw in the towel before that. So in short, it was this combination of passion and perseverance, in my view, that got us through. Passion is an attitude. Perseverance is a behavior. And in many aspects of our lives, our attitudes and behaviors reinforce each other and form a positive feedback loop. Uh, and I can say much more about this. Uh, but... Uh, we hear a lot about passion these days. That's getting boring. Some books also talk about perseverance. That's more interesting. No one is talking about the two, how the two reinforce each other. And so if you can think of any area of your life where you've experienced this positive feedback between passion and perseverance, uh, that's likely to be a really good area, in my experience, to start a business or consider starting a business. Before I go uh, over to Dylan, um, I want to ask you about, you know, you, you brought up a cup, uh, at least one exogenous event. You know, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 are something that we really couldn't have seen coming. Um, the dot-com bubble bursting uh, was another enormous event. Um, in a way, separate out those two things for a moment and talk about kind of just the normal operation of a business like that as an op entrepreneur, as someone who's building that business. What were the things that made your life most difficult in trying to develop and grow that business? Again, setting aside those kind of big world calamitous events that also influenced uh, that period of time for you. Well, the most essential thing uh, an entrepreneur has to do, oh gosh, there are so many different things. One of the things is to ensure a fit between a real unsatisfied customer need and a, a solution to that need. And that fit is constantly changing because you're gaining new resources all the time, new knowledge, new team members, uh, experience, uh, new understandings of the market. And the needs are always changing because uh, new products and services, your competitors are always coming to market. They're being satisfied. And, and so ensuring that fit between an unsatisfied customer need, constantly searching for it and, and doing your best to find a solution for it is, is, is one thing. Uh, creating win-wins among your team members is another uh, a uh, it's it's very easy to uh, get into a mindset where things are a zero sum or a negative sum game in any business, including startups. And it's constantly your job as the leader to find, articulate, and persuade your team members and your customers and all of your stakeholders that. Uh, your business represents a win-win for them. Uh, uh, it could be a career opportunity for team members. It could be uh, a better solution and solving uh, a customer need, more loyal customers in the case of our product, um, on the part of customers, uh, on the part of, of investors. Uh, this is going to be uh, 
a, a great opportunity for them. And, and so creating these win-wins is, is uh, the, the way I think about uh, the uh, essential management challenge. Dylan, one of the reasons I love doing these kinds of events here at uh, Acton is we have someone like John, who's a entrepreneurial practitioner. Um, and then we can combine that with the work that we do here at the Acton Institute, understanding uh, kind of the, the academic perspective, the fundamentals of all of it. We can answer that uh, age old University of Chicago question of uh, it works in practice. Does it work in theory? Hmm. Um, talk about uh, I think something that John was uh, referencing earlier. Uh, actually sets up well for what we talked about that uh, you wanted to start off with, uh, the dot-com bubble bursting in 2000, 2001. Um, that was an incredibly painful time for a lot of people. A lot of entrepreneurs who had startups uh, lost their businesses. Uh, John, of course, has a great story here about uh, one that survives, but a lot of companies went out of business. Um, you know, talk about the role of uh, that churn in the marketplace uh, and that kind of failure is also being really important part of the entrepreneurial process. Yeah, so I think somewhat counterintuitively, and I, I am an academic, so I do approach this more from a theoretical uh, perspective, although my, my wife is an entrepreneur, but I don't want to draw too much on her, her cachet. But, uh, um, but I, I think I think failure is actually the most important thing. If you want to unleash entrepreneurship, it, it it all comes down to your perspective on failure. Um, and and John, I, that was like the perfect <laughs> uh, story that you started with because your perspective was very different. You know, the what is perseverance if not learning how to get back up again every time you fail? Um, and so, in a personal from a personal point of view, uh, if you aspire to be an entrepreneur. Um, but you have a fear of failing, you will never try. Or if you define uh, one failure as proof that you will never succeed, you'll never try again. Um, but if you say, what can I learn from this? As, as John did, you know, that's when you learned the most was when you, things, times were the hardest. Um, if you, you say, I learned more from failing than success, um, then you're, you're going to find those ways. You're going to be looking at the world from a different perspective. So you can put that into the context of a company. Uh, you can fail well or poorly. Um, your business could have failed, right? But because you strive to do so well, because you saw it as a real, you know, a real possibility um, and something that wasn't just personal. You didn't just walk away and say, okay, I'm just going to abandon this, you know. Um, but we're going to find ways to to stick it out and we're going to look at the circumstances around us soberly and, you know, realistically, you're able to succeed and reinvent the company and keep it going. Um and we can keep going. You look at markets, look at industries, look at economies even. Um, if we have just uh, a static view on our economy, um, we will put in place every measure we possibly can to prevent failure. So um, uh, an example of this, uh, we're here in Michigan, um, a big state for the auto industry. At one time, it was incredibly dynamic. Uh, you know, you had Henry Ford and the assembly line He's trying new things. He's taking these risks, um, and he's able to succeed. Fast forward to the, the 1980s. Suddenly, we have competition come from Japan, um, and everyone, um, whether you know the companies, the unions, the cities, state, even um, everyone, just had this very static mindset of you know in De in Detroit we make cars, in Flint we make cars. Um, and they didn't ask, well, what else could our companies be doing? Or how could we be doing this differently? They just tried to set up barriers to other people challenging them. They, they tried to insulate themselves from failure rather than accept it as just part of their part of the life. That all throughout life, we're going to try things and we're going to fail. Um, and success is more about how do you get back up again? How do you persevere through that failure than never failing at all? Um, uh, you, you don't do amazing things by never failing. You do amazing things by being willing to fail, to, to try that great thing, um, even if failure should come. So that, that to me is, is from a theoretical point of view, uh, a through line, whether it's in a, a person's personal life, whether we talk about public policy. Um, so uh, in the last panel, Joseph Schumpter was mentioned, for example. Uh, he talks about this idea of creative destruction, that how economies grow is through one market industry or, you know, 
uh, business being destroyed because something new and better has come along. So to use automobiles again, when, when the automobile became affordable, a lot of blacksmiths went out of business. Um, that's sad for the blacksmith and absolutely should care. And we, we need communities in this country that can prop those up who have been left behind uh, when we have rapid economic change. But by and large, the vast majority of people were leaps and bounds better. They were not just quantitatively better, they were qualitatively better. The quality of their life changed, not just better incomes, that sort of thing. But now you can, you can visit family in the next city so much easier. You can ship things across the country so much easier. You know, all the, all the benefits that came from that. Um, you needed to have a market open. The government could have stepped in and said, we're not going to let these blacksmiths fail. Instead, we're going to keep the automobile um, from threatening them. And what will we have? Well, nothing like we have today. It doesn't matter how much you improve uh, being a blacksmith, it's never going to compete with the internal combustion engine, right? Uh, although we do still measure uh, the power of engines and horsepower. It's a little unfair to the horses, I think. But, <laughs> uh, but, but you know, that's, that's kind of a, a, a relic of that, that initial beginnings of the industry, that this was how far we were outpacing the horse. Um, so you need that everywhere. Uh, if, we, if we don't have that, then you start to stagnate and you can even uh, end up with, you know, uh, a regression or depression. Um, so that's the most important thing to me is to, to be realistic about failure and to, to be able to fail, to realize that, that the more we try to prevent the little failures in our life rather than accepting them, taking them with stride, having the, the virtue, the resilience uh, to get back up again, the bigger our failure is going to be when it finally comes. The other side of that failure that you talked about is the rise of a mentality. We certainly heard this back in 2008 with regard to the financial crisis that we looked at a lot of firms and said, they're too big to fail, uh, that we can't allow this level of failure. What do you think drives that mentality to say, you know, as you pointed out, uh, failure, again, we, we got a lot of great Milton Friedman quotes in the last panel. I'll add one now, at least as I, uh, as I remember it, that people describe capitalism uh, or markets as a system of profit and loss. And the loss part is just as important, if not more important than the profit part, because losses are what get, of, get rid of bad, poorly managed companies. But then in comes this mentality that says, oh, we can't let these firms fail. It's too important. What drives that mentality to, that wants to prevent that important loss and failure part of it from running its course? So, you know, in the case of the, the financial crisis, there were a lot of factors, you know, like everything in the economy, it's, it's more complex than my wonderful little theoretical soundbite. But um, so part of that was the way in which we got into that situation um, was through government subsidized home mortgages um, and government and mortgage backed uh, securities. Um, so you, you have things already distorted by the government. Um, that's not to say that therefore, okay, the solution to intervention is more intervention. Um, but there is a consideration to be made. I'm not totally defending it because I, I do think, yeah, let things fail if they can fail. But if you're looking at, okay, everything fails and the whole economy collapses. Yeah. There is a, a last resort role for the state to sometimes step in. Um, but to me, okay, if in, there's an emergency, there's a crisis, sometimes, yeah, we need state action, but we got to take a step back and say, how do we prevent this from happening again? Um, and how did we get to where we got um, so that that was the case? Well, if you have just one company, you know, which is not really the case in the financial sector uh, back in 2008, it wasn't like there was one big monopoly and if it failed, well, then everything went away. So that was not really the case. Um, but if, if you have all the eggs in one basket, then yeah, now you're, you're incredibly fragile. Um, so you, once again, that, that leads me to ask, what are we doing that's keeping newcomers from entering this market and from challenging, you know, this, uh, dominance by one or, you know, many big companies. Um, and usually you're going to find that fear of failure at the heart of it, that, that somebody is looking for the easy win, um, at the expense of, long-term success? Uh, I understand that the number of uh, startups in uh, the U.S. has declined steadily per 10,000 inch Americans from hot 20s in the 1980s to the 
uh, mid-20s in the 90s to the low 20s in the knots to the uh, high teens in the uh, decade we've just completed. And uh, why is that? And I see two main obstacles to entrepreneurship. Uh, one is regulatory, and two is psychological. Um, in most regards, starting a company, in my experience, has gotten easier over the last 30 years. I started my first company in 1992, so that was just over 30 years ago. Uh, since that time, we've got the internet, we've got online apps. If you want to outsource an entire department that is not uh, strategic to your business, you can find a way to do that with technology that's available today that didn't exist back in 1992. Uh, software development platforms are much more powerful th today than they were 30 years ago. What, what might have taken a dozen software developers back then may have taken a half a dozen software developers 10 or 15 years ago, something that takes one or two software developers today. I remember how difficult it was to take a credit card through a website back in the 1990s. Well, that's a trivial operation today, as an example. So in, in I could go on and on. It's easier to find suppliers, customers, uh, investors who share your passions and, and uh, industry focus nowadays than it was way back then. Only in one regard has starting a business, in my experience, gotten harder, and that is regulatory compliance. And I could give dozens of examples. Let me just give one example. Uh, uh, worker status determination. That's to determine whether a worker is an employee or a contractor. Uh, to, uh, it, it's become ever harder to use contractors uh, without them being considered employees. Contractors make it possible to start a company because you can hire them for as many hours a day or per week as you can afford and as they're available and as your company gains resources and momentum and revenues and so forth, you can gradually bring them on for more and more until you're at a point and they're willing to join you full time as an employee. Nowadays, very often, you have to make them an employee from an outset, even if they don't want to be an employee. We see this especially in California, where I'm from, uh, with uh, Assembly Bill 5. Uh, so it's it's and and to justify that someone is a contractor rather than employee, you may have to fill out a a six page form for every individual. Uh, so th that's just one example, and I could I could offer many others. So uh, that's one thing. The other key obstacle I think to entrepreneurship these days is psychological, and I think this is the biggest obstacle because. If I believe I have the skills and knowledge and passion and perseverance and relationships and other resources to start a business and make it a success, success I, I will be able to, even if I don't have those resources. In contrast, if even, even if I do have those, all of those resources, but I don't believe I have the resources to do it, I won't be able to make that, to start that company and make it a success. So psychology, psychology is such an important driver. I'm reminded of the remark by uh, President Obama, uh, you didn't build that. I'm sure everybody remembers when he said that. How unhelpful, uh, how destructive of the positive mindset of the next generation of builders and entrepreneurs in this country uh, to uh, of take away whatever modest credit they might deserve and uh, and uh, enthusiasm they might have for starting something new uh, by saying you didn't build that. 
uh, just the opposite mindset w- would be really wonderful. Uh, and, and words from our, our nation's chief executive. Uh, so uh, there's a lot more I could say about uh, this, but what can you do to protect yourself from negative influences like that? Uh, I think it's helpful to draw what I call a stars chart. Uh, that is, uh, the, the, the word stars with two A's and two R's are skills, technologies, assets, achievements, relationships, reputation, and strengths as in inner strengths. And in under each of those words, write down all of the resources that you have to start a business, whether or not it seems relevant to, to a business or not. This is a good exercise for anyone to do, even if you're not a potential entrepreneur. And it puts you right in front of you all the resources you have to start a business. And that's building of your self-confidence. Uh, and also reading inspirational books. I think the most inspirational book I've ever read is Atlas Shrugged. Has anyone heard of it or read it? It's a novel about entrepreneurs by Ayn Rand. And uh, it may be why I got into entrepreneurship myself. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it pleases me no end that my own book is most frequently described as inspirational. Uh, that's Unleash Your Inner Company. That be, might be another one. Uh, Dale Carnegie, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People is a great, I, I could go on and on, but those are some thoughts. Well, John, you, the stats that you had at the beginning of uh, what you were saying there uh, actually dovetails pretty well into this question from the audience. We remind people we're taking questions on Slido. Go to Slido, S-L-I-D-O dot com. Enter FMRS to uh, enter the question if you have one. Uh, the question is, the United States is one of the most, if not the most, entrepreneurial countries in the world. Why is that the case? Or I guess, you know, John, feel free to answer some uh, context to those numbers you had at the beginning. Why do you think it's declining? Well, negative psychological influences, regulatory constraints. I think of the economy as a huge n-dimensional space. You'll have to forgive me. I'm an engineer from MIT, and so I think in high dimensions. Of course, we can only visualize three dimensions, but that's fine. Think of three dimensions, a big, huge three-dimensional space. Now a regulation comes along and cuts off half of that space. Okay, there's only half of a space left now for all of us to make a living in and to find a way to solve a customer need in. Another regulation comes along and further cuts that space. And then another and then another. And all the range of possibilities that that huge high-dimensionality space used to represent is is limited down to a narrow box, a narrow cube. Think of what it would be like for organisms, people, animals, people, to be in a tiny little space. They're all competing with each other, aren't they? As opposed to uh, taking advantage of all the possibilities the world has to offer. Uh, so every regulation has the potential to uh, disallow new businesses. Uh, I'm reminded of Bastiat, who wrote a, a book called uh, What is Unseen. And, uh, you know, it's easy to see what may be real benefits of a new regulation, but it's hard to see what new innovation is disallowed because of the regulation. I like the idea of... Uh, regulation uh, impact assessments being required whenever there is a new regulation. All of us know about environmental impact assessments that are required for a new real estate project. Uh, How about innovation impact assessments that force us to consider and evaluate what are the likely innovations that are being squelched by each new regulation? I think it would at least raise sensitivity to the issue. Just to, to add to that, because I wouldn't disagree at all, uh, there's also this history we have that the United States from its very beginning, from its founding, 
It's a commercial republic. And you know, we have this idea of an American dream. If you can just make it here, you can make something of yourself. You can have a better life for your children uh, with hard work, with creativity. Um, and that is something that people don't believe anymore, at least not as much anymore. As you know, To get to your point earlier about the psychology of entrepreneurship, um, in many ways, we're living in a nation where that's harder due to regulation, but we're also living at a time where that story is not being told as it used to um, and where people aren't believing it like they used to. Uh, and so, you know, we still have it. It's still here. Um, if you compare us to other developed nations, we are still one of the most entrepreneurial in the world. Um, but as far as the the decline, I think that's got to be part of the story um, that we just don't believe our own story anymore. We don't believe our own principles anymore. Um, and yeah, there are reasons uh, to be pessimistic. If you look at regulation, only usually that's not the reasons why people are pessimistic. Um, but they, even so, you can still do it. Um, and it's something that we really need to find a way to recapture for the next generations might not look exactly um, as it did in the past. You know, maybe the same way of telling that story isn't working, but that doesn't mean the story itself has lost its power. Um, and, you know, there's institutions in our society. I think one of, you know, you mentioned, um, I think it was uh, Friedman or whatever, but just about failure. Yeah, I was talking about that as well. But bankruptcy, bankruptcy is huge. The fact that it's, you can take a risk. If, if your company goes bankrupt, you don't end up in a debtor's prison, right? Like there, there's institutions in our society that also allow that to happen, allow people to take that chance. Uh, to look around and say, you know, I have something to offer and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a shot. Um, but we have, to, we have to find a way uh, to encourage people. So, I mean, maybe that starts on a personal level. Maybe there's creative people in your life. Maybe you are one of those people. Um, so encourage them. At, figure out what, you know, what is holding them back. What are those barriers? And that's not going to be a, a one-size-fits-all answer, right? Um, but help people use the social networks they have. I, I love that idea of like just you know, write out the seven different things and take stock of everything you have going for you. Um, that's something that feels very unnatural for me. I'm a millennial, so I'm not young anymore, but I used to be considered young. Um, that's something that I don't do. Uh, now I, I guess I have some entrepreneurial side to my, my work. I write and I send it out and half the things I write get rejected. Nobody ever reads them. And so I am taking chances. I am trying to be creative. Um, but but that's a step beyond to just sit down and I'm going to take stock of everything I got going for me. Um, that's something that, that needs to be taught, um, that needs to be inspired, perhaps. Um, yeah. We go to another question from the audience, uh, I think provoked by Johnny reference to Atlas Shrugged. Uh, the question is, uh, what does an entrepreneur owe society in return for providing infrastructure and, quote, the rules of the game? Uh, and this uh, question says that uh, they believe that Ayn Rand misses that part in, uh, from her perspective. Misses the part of the part of uh, what does an entrepreneur owe society in return for providing things like infrastructure and, and the rules of the game, a rule of law uh, to be able to proceed? Well, to hark to that, to answer that question, I'd like to hark to Steve Jobs, the late great founder of Apple. Uh, Steve Jobs was not very philanthropic in his lifetime. Uh, it's true. Uh, he, uh, even though he was a billionaire, he didn't give away much of his money, and that really didn't happen until after he died and when it was done by his, his widow. And so a lot of people have said, or I've heard a lot of people say, that what an unethical guy or that doesn't seem very moral uh, that he wasn't willing to do more of that. But look at all the good that Steve Jobs did. He made computing accessible. How many people here, like me, are old enough to remember computing before the Macintosh? Uh, MS-DOS, does that ring a bell? The Microsoft Disk Operating System. It was really hard, cumbersome. Uh, not very many people could use com personal computers because they didn't have the patience to learn it. The Macintosh opened all of that up. Uh, it 
first was optimized for desktop publishing. Uh, it made it much easier to create newsletters, books, printing. Uh, the laser printer was coupled with it. Uh, that spread information widely. Uh, later, he introduced the iPod, which enabled you to carry a thousand songs around with you on your person, making entertainment readily accessible to people, millions of people, whatever music they might want to listen to through new technologies that they developed or refined, at least like FaceTime. They allowed people to stay in touch with their loved ones and provided companionship and family connections to people who might otherwise be alone and by themselves. Uh, if you consider the entire supply chain of Apple's uh, products from the components and subassemblies, uh, on the one hand, all the way through to the people who work for the company, all the way through to the developers of the apps that run on Apple devices, millions of people, well, th certainly thousands and tens of thousands of people have become millionaires thanks to uh, Apple and, and originally Steve Jobs. He has done tremendous good in the world, much more good than someone could be just by giving money away, I think. And, and we, f we tend to forget that uh, just by providing new solutions to unsatisfied human needs, entrepreneurs are doing great good in the world. I think overall entrepreneurs are neither more honest or dishonest or uh, considerate of other people's needs uh, uh, or other people's concerns uh, than, than others. They're neither better nor worse family men and women than others are. But they do make this unique contribution to the world by finding new solutions to unsatisfied customer needs, and that makes the world a better place. So that is a huge ROI to society uh, in response to this question uh, that I think needs to be factored into the calculus. Dylan, we were talking on our podcast, Act and Wine, this morning about the importance of uh, rhetoric and the way we talk about things to reflect the underlying thing we're describing. And so much of the rhetoric around uh, the, the general gist of that question, they talk about uh, successful people uh, giving back. And I always found that to be a bit of a rhetorical trap because I've never gotten the answer to the question, what did they take? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a fundamental, I, I will be clear. I'm, I'm probably not as much of an Ayn Rand fan <laughs> as, as John, but um, I will say there, there's an assumption in that question that infrastructure and rule of law are some kind of gracious gifts given by the government. In fact, they are moral duties the government has to provide for every citizen of the nation. That's not something you say, well, what are you going to give me in exchange for this? Right? That would be incredibly immoral. That's how you have an incredibly corrupt government saying, well, we're not going to be fair to you in the courts. Uh, we're not going to repair your roads or your sewer system unless you're giving something to us. Um, so that is just, a, to me, a, an incredibly um, a mistaken way to conceive of what's going on. Um, but that said, there are all kinds of ways. And I, I think that John Heidel is the most important one. Business is a, a social good. Uh, there's all kinds of ways in which business is a social good. Um, but that said, like businesses do pay taxes. Uh, there, there are all kinds of ways businesses are currently giving back. Um, so I'm not really, I never quite understand the question either because I don't know if it presumes that someone took, but it at least presumes that they were given something uh, somewhat specially when in fact, uh, a government that isn't giving infrastructure and rule of law to every citizen is merely failing in its most fundamental moral obligation. That's, it's not that, oh, they've given some people a gift and not other people. Uh, well, if that's what's happening, then it's an incredibly corrupt government that we're talking about. Um, and actually uh, providing rule of law is not by any means the most expensive part of government. It's if you consider the courts, the dispute resolution, the protection of property rights, 
That's just a tiny part of what we pay for government currently. Some, uh, something that profoundly affected my thinking about property rights was an experiment that I was privileged to sit in on by Vernon Smith, the Nobel Prize winner in experimental economics. Uh, if you had asked me before I set in on this experiment what the source of property rights was, I think I would probably say governments. But uh, using this experiment where there were a bunch of tables in a conference room, each table was a group of people who were a business, and there was a big screen that showed uh, whether each business was making blue balls or red balls. And uh, to sell a product, you had to have one of each of these two balls. It's a very simplified economy, in other words. And uh, all of our tables suddenly realized that we could start stealing from other uh, tables uh, through the uh, network that was provided. Uh, and so just as uh, someone was about to sell a pair of red and blue balls that, that were a product, someone might steal one of the balls, and it ended up that none of us were making anything. And then suddenly, it, it dawns on one of the tables, hey guys, if we just trade rather than steal, we'll all make a lot more money. And uh, what uh, Vernon Smith's experiments showed is how property rights can emerge spontaneously by people uh, in the same community. It doesn't even have to come from the top down. And, and that's not surprising when you think about it, because property rights of a primitive sort exist even in the natural world. I was in an aquarium in uh, Rio de Janeiro a few weeks ago, and I learned that moray eels have property rights or, or of, of a sort. They're territorial, and uh, they defend their territory against uh, other moray eels who might come in, in to that region and... and uh, take the food from that region. So uh, anyway, it doesn't take much in the way of government uh, to provide the basics that, that we really need. Go to another question from the audience here. Uh, it was said earlier that regulatory compliance is one of the hardest obstacles that entrepreneurs face. Uh, can you give an example of regulations that uh, are necessary and needed? Well, lots of regulations are, are needed and 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 helpful and inescapable. There's no doubt about it. I'm not suggesting there shouldn't be regulations, uh, but there's a good way to do regulations and there's a bad way. Uh, the best regulations are those that are informed by real court cases where there is a dispute and a court of law or a judge has to adjudicate and decide what the best resolution for that dispute is. Where, in other words, do you draw the boundary but in, the, in property rights? And if a statute is informed by that history of cases, in, in other words, by common law, uh, it will have the advantage of uh, aligning with what the society or community considers most fair and reasonable. Uh, so uh, we, the, so this is one of the best kept secrets, or at least people aren't talking about it or have forgotten about it. But up until about a century ago, the United States was primarily a common law country. That is, there were relatively few statutes uh, there were most of the law was uh, determined by courts of law, judges, juries deciding what the best resolution. And one of the beautiful things about common law is it gives the judge the flexibility to find the optimal resolution between two uh, litigants. And so it's a learning process. If the litigants suggest a solution that they both consider ideal for both of them, it's unlikely that the judge is going to overturn that. And so uh, it's Im also implicitly a 
uh, sort of consensus-oriented legal regime. We have veered so far away from that over the last century that uh, people have almost forgotten about it. In fact, law schools nowadays just teach common law sort of as incidental rather than foundational. That's too bad, it seems to me, because it should be the foundation of law. It's emergent, organic, rather than imposed from the top down, as statutes are. I think there's an important point here as well about the word we're talking about, regulate, to make regular. Um, I think so much of what we talk about in terms of regulation, though, isn't making things regular across all actors in a marketplace. It is making things quite irregular by picking and privileging certain firms or certain entities who have the ability to lobby politicians in order to get what they want. Yeah. So the the German economist, uh, Walter Eucken, uh, who along with uh, Wilhelm Rupke and Lud Ludwig Erhard were kind of the architects of the West German economic miracle, their recovery after World War II and um, you know, Nazi party. And before that, uh, during the Great Depression, just, they tried every terrible economic policy you can think of in Germany. Um, one of the things he said that's always stuck with me is regulation of market structures, yes. Regulation of market processes, no. His point being that if you're under your philosophy of regulation is we got to go in and we got to set the prices because we don't trust the market actors to do that. Or we got to subsidize various industries or companies because we don't trust people to be able to, to start up um, on their own or to compete uh, with whether foreign or domestic competitors or so on and so forth. Um, when you do that, it just distorts everything. It's just normal about human beings producing things out of their own creativity to serve the needs of other human beings and exchanging in a marketplace. Um, regulating market structures is about that market openness uh, that you need, the openness for newcomers, which means that openness to, yeah, some people aren't always going to be successful. Some businesses, uh, you know, they start up, they don't succeed. Sometimes they're around for a little bit, then they fail. Sometimes they sell out to something else. Sometimes they become really big uh, and things go great. And then another industry comes along and completely displaces it. Um, that's all normal. And that's, if you let that happen, uh, it's, you know, counterintuitively this great, great benefit for, for everyone involved. So on the government side, I would say that's the good kind of regulation It's a regulation that keeps markets open, um, that, that where equality before the law, the rule of law is really the standard. Um, but that's not the only way to regulate a market. And this doesn't get talked about enough that on the private side, there are all sorts of ways that you can regulate markets. So if you're concerned about, you know, so for example, and, and, and this, is, this comes up a lot, but I still think it's a great example. I believe in all 50 states and the District of Columbia, you have to have a government permit in order to be a hairdresser, right? You have to get the permission of the, the government in whatever jurisdiction you're in in order to be a hairstylist or to, to be a barber, that sort of thing. Um, and that's, it's the sort of thing that should be the easiest thing for any, any person in their home to say, I want to, you know, get some extra income. I want to maybe try this out. It should be easy, but instead they find themselves in the black market because they can't afford the, you know, year and a half, $3,000 of training they need to actually qualify for this certification. Um, but if you are concerned about whatever governments may be concerned about with, with hairdressers, I heard recently an outbreak of ringworm among barbers. So I guess maybe there could be some health uh, concerns or whatever. Um, but a lot of that gets solved, A, first of all, through competition. So if you go to your barber and you get ringworm, you're probably not going to that barber again, right? Um, but secondly, um, you can easily have people come together, as happens in, in many industries, where people come together and they don't have the force of the law to require every newcomer to, to sign on with their certification, but they within their profession can certify that, you know, this is, you know, the, the American Barbers Association certified, you know, barbershop, right? So there's a, a standard of quality that people have to meet if they want to join, but they can still start up on their own without that. Um, that's a way to regulate a market. It, it's a signal for buyers when, when they're going to find a product they say, oh, you know, I trust the American Barbers Association or whatever made up, uh, you know, board we want to we think of. Um, that, that signals to me that, yeah, that's what I want. 
other people they'd say, oh no, you know, my friend down the street, he can cut my hair better. You know what I'm, people still do it in their home, but, um, but again, it should be something that is a stepping stone to something greater instead of, you know, something that you can only kind of do in this, this really black market way these days. So, uh, that's just a tiny example, but I think that's worth thinking about that there's not enough creative entrepreneurial thinking when it comes to regulation. If we care about the environment, we care about health, um, all those sorts of things, our first and only answer does not have to be the state. Yeah, I think uh, this is a case where I don't quite realize my own privilege in some of these things because I have yet to meet the barber who can screw up my haircut. <laughs> so whether they're certified or not, I don't know that it matters. John, you had something you wanted to add. So here are some thoughts for sound regulatory design. The most important principle is that things can evolve, that regulations can evolve with society, the economy, and technology. So when there's an issue or a problem, of course, our natural first reaction is there's got to be a law. There's got to be a regulation. No, push back on that. That should not be our first natural impulse, although it usually is. What should be? The first natural impulse was if you two folks can't resolve the issue yourselves, then uh, take it to a court of law and let the judge or, if appropriate, jury decide uh, what the best resolution is for that concern. Uh, after we have a number of those cases so we can see a clear pattern in how they're being resolved in that jurisdiction in that society. Great. Then we c that builds our confidence that we can make a rule, a statute, if there's a consistent pattern there. If not, then we might want to wait until we see a consistent pattern. Or if there are two distinct cases, maybe we reflect those distinct cases in a statute. And then that statute should have a limited lifetime, three years, five years, so that it automatic things change, society changes, technology, economies, let it automatically expire at the end of some period of time so that it has to be renewed after that uh, deliberately by the uh, body, the parliament, whoever. Uh, limit the number of words and pages. If there are more than certainly a hundred pages, people are not going to read it. They're not going to be able to comprehend all of the implications of it and all of its unintended consequences. Also, it's a great opportunity for people to sneak in uh, uh, things that benefit a particular special interest group, which we don't want. And uh, so uh, limit the number of pages, have sunset clauses, and uh, those are a few thoughts. As an editor, I second uh, word and page limits on, on laws, and on everything, really. If, if there's a way to apply the regulation to a limited geographical area so we can do an A-B test after some period of time to see what the effects were in that area versus what were the effects in the area that did not have the regulation, in other words, do a real natural experiment, that's ideal also. We've got about five minutes left, uh, so I want to close with a related question to, to each of you. Um, so as we noted, John, you approach this as an entrepreneurial practitioner. Uh, Dylan, you approach these questions from an academic standpoint. So, uh, John, for you, if you have a budding entrepreneur who approaches you and wants one really good piece of advice about pursuing an, an entrepreneurial uh, endeavor, What's that piece of advice that you would give them? And then for Dylan, what's one thing that you think that person should understand about kind of the academic view of entrepreneurship that would benefit them as well? John, we'll start with you. Well, I started my first company with a really cool technology for which there was no market need. And it took me six to nine months to let go of that idea and replace it for something for which there was a real market need, namely the ability to do surveys on the internet. This is back in the early 90s. That product, Decisive Survey, became a hit, and the company is part of Google today. So it really does work. Start with 
uh, the real unsatisfied customer need. And that way you'll know that you really are addressing a customer need. It's especially for engineering folks like me, it's so easy to get enamored with a technology, uh, a solution, and then try to force fit that solution to a customer need or invent a customer need when there isn't one. Start with a customer need and you may find that it doesn't even need that cool technology that you had in mind. There might be a much easier, a direct way, more direct way to address it. So theorists study entrepreneurship because they are not good at doing it. Because if, if you could start a business and be successful, um, you would do that instead of studying how people do it. Um, so I, I, I would say, start by saying that the people who study entrepreneurship uh, are doing so more for the non-entrepreneurs. And that's very important, actually. It gets into everything we've been talking about in terms of uh, you know, the structure of a market, what opportunities are available, what regulations are there, what barriers are in the way. Um, and having that understanding for the general public and especially for policymakers is incredibly important. So there, there's a role to play there. Um, that said, uh, now I will borrow from my wife. Uh, she Every time she meets an economist, uh, she says, what is the one thing that you wish uh, entrepreneurs knew about economics? Um, and the best answer uh, she got, actually from my PhD supervisor, uh, Philip Booth, uh, was uh, about reducing transaction costs. Um, and John already mentioned this in terms of uh, the changes in operation systems from DOS to, to the Macintosh um, and then to Windows and that sort of thing. And, we, you know, we could get into all sorts of um, areas in which that applies. But any way you can do things in a more efficient manner, you know, or you mentioned uh, contractors, how they allow you to really outsource whole portions of a business nowadays. They, they, they make, they've made entrepreneurship easier. Um, so ways in which you can reduce those transaction costs, make, you know, your good idea that seemed impossible now suddenly possible. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Actin Line, I'm Eric Combs.